Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Uh, my name is Paul Ekman. Uh, I'm a retired professor of psychology from UCSF. I opened a small business about when I retired seven years ago that uh, develops uh, training uh, and some research relevant to both emotional skills and to my other area, which is deception and demeanor. But I think you're primarily interested in the emotion area. And uh, so it, I'm looking at this the topic of empathy, so I'm really focusing on that topic. I know you've done a lot on the theme of compassion. Yes, well, compassion actually is a more recent interest. My basic research program for many years was on emotion, its expression, and to a lesser extent, its physiology. Uh, the work on physiology was all collaborating with other investigators. But my work did help to establish that there are some universals in emotion. Um, all human beings have the same emotions. They may experience them somewhat differently. They may have different attitudes about them. Um, but uh, it's one of the things that Darwin said unifies mankind. And also, really from a Darwinian perspective, it cuts across species. We are not the only animals that have emotions. And to some extent, the signals uh, for emotions, because emotions aren't quiet. We can hear them in the sound of the voice, and we can see them on the face. Thoughts are quiet. Attitudes are quiet. Values are quiet. Uh, we don't know what they are, as somebody tells us, if we want to believe what they tell us. But emotions uh, are written on the face and influence the voice. And to some extent, those signals are universal too. And that again unifies our species. And uh, you don't need a Berlitz book for facial expression. You do for language. Language is a culture-specific product, as are the symbolic gestures like A-OK. -okay. Now, since I got to know the Dalai Lama 11 years ago, uh, I've become interested in compassion, which is his primary interest, and in how it differs from emotion. And it does in some important ways. But that, of course, got me into dealing with the issue of empathy, um, which is a, a bit of a minefield. Now, not everybody agrees about what compassion is, but there's certainly more agreement about compassion, which I see as a lot more specific in its focus than empathy. I would not consider myself an expert on empathy. I've never studied empathy per se. Um, but the way I have to think about it in order to write about compassion. So I view there being two kinds of empathy, uh, cognitive and affective. In cognitive, I appreciate how other people are feeling, but I don't feel it. I just understand it. And it doesn't matter what the feeling is. If my cognitive empathy, I, maybe I'm the type of person that I cannot appreciate how other people would ever feel contempt. I just can't understand that. Well, that, I'd be, that would be a, a block in that part of cognitive empathy. Um, the affective empathy is that I actually can, and at least sometimes do, feel in my own body what other people are feeling. Now, I say it's much broader than compassion, because compassion is focused on the issue of suffering. If I feel your joy, you're not suffering at all, but that's an empathetic response. Uh, if I feel your anger, and I join you in your anger, what an outrageous act it is. That's very empathetic. It's not compassion at all. Compassion is a subset uh, I believe of both the affective and the cognitive uh, focused on the issue of trying to deal with the suffering of another person. So it's a much more narrow slice from the empathetic world. Uh, that's at least how I think about it. So that's, that's kind of how I've been looking at empathy and compassion, that 
uh, empathy then is kind of this broad empathizing with every feeling that the person has and compassion is kind of empathy applied to pain? Well, there's more suffering than pain. I mean, suffering is a, pain is a very literal, particularly if you're using pain for physical pain, of which there are many different kinds. The human body is equipped with an amazing variety of terrible pains. The human body is equipped with an amazing variety of quite different pains, depending not just on the locale, but which nerves are involved and how they're involved. So there are many different ways in which we can physically hurt. But we can mentally hurt without really any physical pain. And it can be a mental anguish, a mental suffering. I think compassion encompasses both. And so if I know that you're terribly uh, upset and uh, that you're suffering from anxiety or despair or a loss of hope, I can feel compassion to try to relieve what are really, I mean, when I say they're mental, I mean that they don't involve physical pain. Of course, everything is mental. I mean, everything is really uh, being directed, at least in my mind, not in the Dalai Lama's mind, but it's all uh, coming from the brain. That's where everything originates. And uh, uh, the Dalai Lama and I disagree in that he believes when the brain is dead, the mind still is alive and continues. And I don't. I think the mind is just a less precise term for the mental activities that are generated by the brain. Does he have the same definition of, of compassion and empathy as you do? Uh, I know he has the same definition of compassion. Uh, we have not yet, I hope in our next meeting, we will see whether we agree about com uh, empathy. Now, I'm using another term that some other investigators use, which is resonance. And resonance simply refers to the actual experience of having the same experience. Whether or not um, the... I can resonate to you in two very different ways. Um, if I can resonate by having the same feeling, or I can resonate with quite a different feeling. So if you're angry, I can say, oh, I'm so sorry that you're angry. I feel really badly that you're so angry, that you've been so frustrated. That's a resonant response, but it's not the same feeling. People like, so it, resonance, I believe, is another term the, for empathic empathy. If we leave out of empathy the sympathetic concern to act to relieve, some people do and some people don't leave that out. Um, the compassion, as I define it, involves both the affective experience, oh, I really wish to relieve your suffering. I'm moved by your suffering. I'm resonating to your suffering. And the action. Uh, now, there's no necessary connection between the two. We often presume that there is and that there should be. Uh, but in that way, compassion is no different from emotions. The, at least when we get to be an adolescent or an adult, we can feel the emotion and not act on it. So the fact that I'm very angry doesn't mean I'm going to hit anybody. I, uh, any more than the act, the fact that I feel terribly compassionate towards the suffering of the people in Libya doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to donate money or fly over there to try to help them. That's an action. Does the action require the affective feeling? The Dalai Lama believes that it does at least in the early stages. But he believes, and I think it's true for him, that compassionate acts become involuntary. And in some sense, you can't not act. You must act. 
Now, if that was so for emotions, we'd be in a lot of trouble. If every time I felt fear, I had to run, if every time I felt anger, I had to attack, that wouldn't be a very easy way for the world to be. Uh, and we really wouldn't like to get along. We wouldn't get along with people who always acted on the feelings they had. And there is a kind of compassion that interests me a great deal, which is preventive compassion which is, you're not suffering now, but I can foresee that in the future you are likely to suffer and that there are actions I can take to reduce that likelihood. That can be very effective. And in my view, that would be very compassionate. Very unlikely there's any affective or empathetic feelings involved in that. I don't know, I, I think there's a motivation, but not an, a, an empathetic experience. The motivation is the wish to do good. Sounds like an old-fashioned motivation, but it's a wish that you know people have written about since people were writing about human experience. Sort of projecting into the future what can happen. And That's trying right, to... and trying to avoid disaster. Trying to avoid, so if I work on earthquake prevention and spend my life working on earthquake prevention, I think you could regard me as a compassionate person. I'm working to try to prevent people from suffering in earthquakes. Now you could say, well, that's very distant, they're not suffering now. But what's motivating me to do that? Is it because that's the way to be able to drive a, uh, a Bentley or a Rolls Royce? Probably not. You're probably not doing that out of a motive to accumulate material wealth. Are you doing that simply because it's the most fascinating problem in the world? Well, that may be what sustains it, but probably not what gets you involved. And similarly, uh, I spent most of my career at a medical school. If you look at the motivation that gets students involved in medicine, it's very often to try to do good in the world. It's a preventive compassion. It doesn't always stay that way. The system in which they have to operate and their experiences, at least for some, changes or dilutes or deadens that original motivation. Uh, seems to do that less for nurses. Uh, I've heard the same in the legal field, too. Well, it depends on the field. Certainly, public defenders, um, I think the ones that I know, I would say the motivation is to do good in the world. I'm not so certain about the corporate lawyers that I know, but that was, uh, I think they were out to, to accumulate power and, corp and wealth. Well, we were talking about kind of the definition of empathy and compassion, and another way of looking at the definition is uh, the use of metaphors. Uh, empathy is kind of defined uh, commonly as the metaphor of looking through someone else's eyes and standing in someone else's shoes. I was wondering if you had like a personal metaphor of what empathy would be like. Well, the, if I look through your eyes, then the question is, am I, am, is, it, is it me who is still looking? Or has my self merged with yourself? Um, I don't think of that as being a necessary part of empathy. It's only the resonance for the affective or the cognitive appraisal that I can do something, uh, that I can understand the feelings that you're having. Uh, now, if you are, let's suppose, let's, let me think of a good example. Suppose you believe that monarchy is the best form of government, and you're totally committed to it, and trying to bring back constitutional monarchies. I can, to some extent, understand that view. Is that being empathetic, that I can understand your view? Is empathy, are we going to say empathy is, extends to all, understanding all human experience, or is it limited to understanding in the realm of emotion or affect. 
Uh, I would prefer to keep it in the realm of emotion and affect. So if you're a dog lover, and you know you have five dogs that live in your apartment, and you take them out three times a day, and they are your life. Well, actually, I would find that quite hard to understand, but if I did understand it, would that mean I was being empathetic? I would not like to use... Then the term empathy starts to lose its meaning. It's, so I'm not talking about understanding in general. I'm not, talking ab- I'm not talking about... And it, really, if I got inside your eyes and your shoes, I might be able to understand why in the world you're so nuts about dogs, but I wouldn't be empathetic. So I think empathy is really focused around emotional experience. Maybe moods as well, although very few people have talked about it in that fashion. It's mostly the feelings that another person is having. Uh, well, that seems to be uh, the common thought now is that it's based on mirror neurons. That yes. That we're mirroring as, as I'm even watching you, I'm, I'm feeling... I, of course, I have some doubts about that. Mm -hmm. That is, I'm not convinced as yet that when you feel what I feel, your feelings of my feelings are identical in all respects. They are a perfect mirror replica. Um, I don't think the evidence is there for that. Approximation, perhaps? Maybe some partial approximation. It's an open question. It's not for me to decide. It really depends on how the brain was designed. And uh, if I was designing the brain, which I didn't, I will, of course, I would have designed it in some very different ways, but I certainly wouldn't have made it that when you feel what another person feels, it is exactly the totality of that experience. Um, now, actually, I think that's probably extremely unlikely because if you, if I can use a metaphor, um, each of us experience the same emotions, which to some extent means that we have the same emotion programs, both hardwired and acquired, stored somewhere in our brain in some circuitry. But they play on different hardware. Uh, you may, your hardware may be a Mac, mine might be a PC, and not all PCs are the same, nor are all Macs. They have different operating systems. They have different speed. So even the very same emotion experienced by two different people may be experienced quite differently. There'll be similarities, but there'll be differences as well. So I think the likelihood that two people ever have identical emotional experience, probably pretty low. And it's certainly not relevant to the issue of compassion, nor is it relevant to the issue of sympathy. I mean, I see sympathy as being a step in addition to empathy, in that I not only know how you feel or feel how you feel, but I feel some concern about it. I may feel it's appropriate for you to feel that way. I might feel it's inappropriate. Usually we think of sympathy as being when we feel it's appropriate and it's right. And I sympathize, meaning I feel that you are justified, or at least it's understandable, why you feel the way you feel. As That's going beyond empathy into sympathizing with you. Sometimes I've heard of sympathy defined as if if empathy is kind of a mirroring uh, process, that sympathy is that you see someone in pain and you feel sorrow. So it's like... So sympathy is only for pain? Um, It seems that's what... uh, I think I could be be sympathetic with your anger. Uh And I could think, oh, you know, if that happened to me, I'd be outraged Mm -hmm. too. And I would take a bat into my hands and just beat that person up just like you're doing, and I, I think you can be sympathetic with any, any emotional response. I don't see any reason. It's the justifiability. It's not just that you're understanding it, not just that you're understanding it cognitively or feeling it effectively, but your understanding extends to why it's occurring and its appropriateness. If I think 
that it's absolutely mistaken for you to be so upset. I can understand, I can even... I grew up with such a clock. Mm, so you'd like to have it around? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, I don't usually hear it, mm -hmm. but it reassures me to have it in the background. Yeah. The um, Where was sympathy I? Sympathy and uh, sympathy with anger. And I can, I think, feel your anger and be totally unsympathetic with it. I can feel that you're really furious. I can, f I can understand why you're furious, cognitive. I can even feel some of your anger, but it's a total mistake. You've totally misappraised the situation. Anger is the wrong response. It's totally unsympathetic, right? So to be sympathetic, I have to think it's justifiable. It's, it's, kind of, it's like saying I would do the same thing. thing. Kind of even thing. if I wouldn't do it, it's okay that you are doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can at least understand why you're doing it, and I don't condemn you for doing it. If I condemn you for doing it, I'm totally unsympathetic. Kind of judgment in yeah, that case. Right. I wanted to go back to the uh, metaphors, because I, I just really love metaphors. And uh, when I ask uh, people about metaphors for empathy, it's interesting, because they all they come up with different ones. Like, everybody almost has a totally different metaphor and I mean metaphors in terms of if empathy was like a type of animal or a type of land or you know it's kind of more of an imaginative I know yep. that's a reminder of the next appointment I think let me just see I think of my iPhone as my mother it's always trying to keep me on track yes that says I have a 330 appointment if we're out of here by 5 to 3 how long do we have then? That would give us 25 okay. minutes, Good. including your breakdown time. Uh, yeah, I can. That'll work? It's a couple minutes. The. Uh, so I could just say for I, me, the metaphor of empathy, for me, empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense that now I'm sitting here and experiencing all your feelings in this interview and I'm empathizing with you. So I'm having this rich uh, experience. So that's kind of the aspect of empathy that resonates with me. Well, as a behavioral scientist who studies emotion, I don't really deal much with the world of metaphor. In fact, metaphors come up for me when I listen to music or look at paintings or go to the ballet. But in my work and thinking and research, I avoid them. Mm -hmm. And I, because I Need I'm interested in explicit conceptualizations and metaphors may cause understanding, but they don't provide enough precision. And they lead you away from being able to measure the phenomena. And of course, you can't do science unless you can, in some way, observe the phenomena in a way that everyone else can observe it. Repeatability is a key. So you can observe things in a way that's unique to you. Well, that's useless to science. It may be very interesting to read as art. Uh, uh, if I write a poem about empathy, that may be appreciated by many people who have no use scientifically. Mm -hmm. Unless it causes the scientist to think of, ah, I can see a way I could observe that in a way that any other person who read my description of how I observed it, they would see exact and hear exactly what I see and hear. And uh, having thought this way now for more than 50 years, it's hard for me to get out of it. Yes. That, uh -huh. And that means it's one of the reasons why I can write lucid nonfiction for the layman. Uh, I'm told by people who've read my, the books I've written for a general public that they're very understandable, but they don't have any metaphors. I tell stories, uh, but they're life stories. And, uh, but my literary agent says to me when I try to write fiction, where are the metaphors? Just as you're asking, well, the metaphors are just not part of my 
thinking. And, uh, well, in it's... terms of uh, life story then, if you kind of look at the narrative of your life, how did your kind of uh, understanding of, of the word empathy kind of evolve uh, to, from you know, childhood till now? I didn't, I didn't think much about empathy until the last few years. And it's only been forced on me because of the Dalai Lama's interest in compassion has gotten me interested in can I think that through in, in an interaction with him, because he's an extremely bright man, and because he comes from an intellectual tradition so independent from the Western tradition I was brought up in, so can, when the two of us think about an issue, can we advance it before either, before the place that either one of us was at, before the conversation. So in talking with him about compassion and then beginning to write about uh, the nature of compassion and how it differs and is, how it's similar and how it's different from emotions. Uh, the, and I strongly believe that the evidence suggests that compassion is not an emotion. Not everything is an emotion, and compassion isn't, um, in, in my view. So that's forced me to have to consider some of the... Forced, I say, because I would rather not have to deal with all that confusing literature about empathy. Uh, the literature about compassion the, in the sciences is a smaller literature and a bit more convergent than the empathy literature, which is all over the place. So you're more interested in the kind of how the face uh, well, expresses emotion? Uh, or, or, well, not about, I think I already know most of what there is to know about how the face expresses emotion. And I'm reasonably convinced that there is no signal that's unique for compassion, as there is one for anger or fear or sadness. Um, but, you know, I'm interested in compassionate action, compassionate behavior. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, physiology, the origin. So it's not just expression. The expression, I think, I'm reasonably content there isn't there anything to learn about compassion from expression, because it has no expression. Uh, Someone told me their de his definition of empathy was when the blocks to action are removed. The true deep empathy happens when you're doing something together and there's no kind of a conflict in, in the action. Well, that's a congruence of action, but the, well, you know, everyone's entitled to their own definition. It's whatever, you know, you make up a definition for a particular purpose. And if it opens up new questions and new issues and new findings, then it's a good definition. So I wouldn't define it that way because I wouldn't find that terribly useful. Uh, I think the, I don't, I can feel what you feel without acting as you act. And besides which, you may never act. You may just feel. The, uh, you may be quite content to just have the feeling and not have any action whatsoever. Are so. you familiar with the work of Carl Rogers? He used uh, kind of a lot of reflective... Oh, yes, God. I was brought up at the very end of that tradition. I was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, 49 to 52, and Rogers was around then in the psychology department. I never met him, I heard him talk. Um, he was not too accessible to undergraduates. Uh, the, uh, but I certainly knew about Rogerian therapy and the theory that it under underlie it. It's, it, it's, I would bet you that the people who graduate with a PhD in clinical psychology from Berkeley couldn't give you two sentences about Carl Rogers. I just don't think it survived, which doesn't mean that it's wrong. Psychology is a field that has killed its own history, and very few people, there used to be, when I got my PhD, I will now sound like an old geezer because things have changed in ways I don't like. When I got my PhD, you had to take a course in the history of the field. That course no longer exists. 
not only not required, it's not taught at most universities, to leave out the history of any field of science is an unbelievable mistake. It means that you will continue to reinvent wheels that were invented 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago. Well, that, that uh, tradition has uh, kind of been um, built on by uh, Marshall Rosenberg. I don't know if you're mm-hmm. familiar with him and nonviolent communication, where there's a whole community that kind of does this empathic, what they call empathic listening. Yes. Using reflective listening and, and then trying to get to the deeper, uh, what they call needs or values of, of people. You can use it in a variety of ways. The uh, when I teach law enforcement about how to get a criminal suspect to talk, because the more words someone speaks, the greater the likelihood you'll make an accurate judgment about whether they're truthful or lying. And of course, some people who are under suspicion of committing a crime are perfectly innocent. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and suspicion has fallen on them. And one of the things I teach them is reflective. So one of the easiest ways is if there's a pause, repeat back the last three words the person said. Then they're liable to pick up and continue to speak. For a very different purpose is to try, you know, it's to try to get people to talk more. Although I think that was part of Roger's purpose. You know, there's a lot of research to suggest that if you can get people to talk into a, a uh, audio recorder you get as much improvement on all the measures we have of psychotherapy as talking to a therapist. It's the talking process. When you talk, you go through a set of mental operations that cause you to engage in some self-reflection, some consideration, some transformation of experience. And that, we used to think that a sympathetic listener, that is someone who wasn't going to condemn you but try to understand how you feel, was a critical ingredient. There's less reason to believe that now. In fact, the listener doesn't seem to be the issue. Uh, I have a little bit of skepticism about that because I do believe that um, one of the therapeutic elements is not what therapy the person does, but the nature of the listener, some qualities of that listener him or herself. But clearly, just talking is very helpful too. Uh, so it seems to be that quality of being heard, as I understand it, with uh, if people feel heard and connect, a, a connection that they have that oxytocin release that uh, is like the stress reliever and gives that warm feeling of, of, uh, of the. Well, the well, certainly people feel better. I'm less and less interested. These days, the big interest is, can I say what chemical, what brain pathway? Well, that doesn't explain matters for me. Um, it's, unless you think of artificially injecting them, which of course some people think of, but if you're not out for chemical interventions or for doing things to the brain, then to, to know what pathways involved, uh, the, or to know what chemical is released is only useful from a research point of view if you need that as a measure of is that phenomena occurring again? What other things will release oxytocin? Well, sex will release it. I don't think of a sex, sexual intercourse as an activity that involves necessarily ref, much reflective listening. In fact, my bet is that would inhibit sexual Actually, like the deep reflective uh, connection, though, because I, I do uh, freestyle dance every week, mm-hmm. and I've actually done reflective movement, and it's kind of like I'll say, oh, what's your movement? Then I'll try to mirror the movement, and then the person will say, oh, here's my movement, and we do this until we kind of like connect, and then it's almost like we're moving in this harmonic, I already know where the person's going to be moving before they, they move there, so it feels pretty good. Yeah, yeah, people do like that. Whether that releases oxytocin or not, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure I would care. That the important thing would be to, to me to identify the kind of situations that people find feel good and uh, which they want to repeat. There's some things that feel good which I certainly would never want to repeat. 
there. But there are certain kinds of things like looking out the window, which I'm doing occasionally now, seeing the boats on the bay. That always makes me feel good. So I'm kind of looking at what can we do to actually uh, create uh, you know, social structures of uh, the society so it's more supportive of empathy and is there some thoughts you have about that? Is that uh, what we can actually do for that? Or is it even something that we should attempt? Well, I believe that the survival of uh, the planet as we know it depends on developing what I'm calling global compassion. And that is where we feel, to at least some extent, a concern for the, to reduce the suffering of all human beings, not just those of the same skin color or nationality or ethnic group. The world is very far from that. And whether we can get there in time, I don't know. I guess I'd have to bet against it if I was betting. But it's clearly what's needed. If everybody felt the same way towards all human beings that they feel towards members of their immediate family, or put it even in a more extreme fashion, the way they felt towards their, in, their offspring when they were helpless, and our offspring are helpless pretty much the first three years of life, long period of infantile dependence, longer than any other animal, and what seems to be built into human beings in order to sustain this period of infantile dependence is an impulsive wish to help and avoid the suffering of helpless offspring. Now, there are very few people, a very few, who feel that way towards all human beings. You've got to have some of that feeling towards all human beings if you're going to be willing to adjust your standard of living so that instead of obesity being your problem, starvation won't be your problem. It is amazing that we live in a country where obesity is second or third health problem, and there are countries where starvation is the health problem. We just don't have, we overeat and they can't get enough to eat. So how do we adjust that? Well, we have to first care about them, not just about us. How do we achieve that? Is empathy the role for achieving that? I don't have the answers, I only have the questions. But it's clear to me it's the number one problem. Uh, it's the number one issue I'm talking with the Dalai Lama about. He believes there are Buddhist practices that will help us achieve that. I think even if he's right, it's a lost cause because they'll take too long. And you know, he says one person at a time. We haven't got enough time for one person at a time to do eight hours a week of if that was enough of meditation, uh, the world will be hopelessly polluted, irreversibly polluted, if we do it one person at a time by their devoting eight hours a week to meditation. First of all, we can't reach enough people to get them to do it. Uh, and uh, we've got to find some other means. I don't know what they are. There may not be any. Not every problem has a solution. If this one doesn't have a solution, then my grandchildren will not live in the same world that I lived in. And that would be very unfortunate. It's, been a be it's a beautiful world. I hate to see the fish you know, disappear, and the birds disappear, and the climate get so punishing, and the air get dirty. These are all things that if we had a more global compassion wouldn't be happening. So it means we have to care about other people in a way that most people don't. And yet the capacity is built into us. The Buddhists say the seed for compassion is mother-infant. But think of what that means. That means that built into every human being is a seed, an unnourished seed, sufficient for the helpless infant and not sufficient for the helpless rest of the world. So my question, for which I can offer you no answer, and I don't know that I'll ever get to an answer, is how can we extend that? That's what we need to do.
so we can put that question out there, and hopefully people who are watching this can start thinking about that. Well, I put it out wherever I get the chance. <laughs> <laughs> Help! Help, right. Work on this. That's right. Work it's, on uh, this problem. People. Right. It's, you know, I'm uh, 77 years old. Most I can do is raise questions at this point. Most of the research I've done has taken 10 or 15 years. So it's... And even there, I'm not sure what research I would do on this. So I think it takes more thinking to try to figure out what's the path. I'm not certain I've... At least I haven't seen the path. I don't think it's going to come from religious conversions. And I don't think it's going to come from Buddhist meditation. It, for enough people in a short enough time. You know, Barack Obama ran on the value of empathy. Yes, um, he did. I've did. gone through all of his speeches, and he's mentioned empathy uh, more than 60 times in his speeches. And at some points he said, the most important thing I learned from my mother was empathy. The country has an empathy deficit. Look at the speeches of the last six months and see how often he's mentioning it. See what being a president has done to him. I suspect it has not been good for his empathetic concerns because the constraints for a president are so enormous and the problems are so enormous. Uh, we should. Okay. A few more, few sure. more minutes, Would anything left? Anything, anything to uh, um, wrap up? Anything you'd like to say? No, I think I actually, in the last few minutes, said the things that are my primary moral concerns. and. Uh, you know, we, as scientists, we are dedicated to describing, and morality, we forget, is what got us involved in it in the first place. We're trying to do good and, uh, in the world, and believing uh, that science could produce knowledge that would lead to better lives for all people. And I think you can point out where you know, science has been a double-edged sword, but it has probably resulted in more reduction of suffering, extension of life, reduction of starvation than it has in the killing of people and uh, disinhabiting them. But it is, uh, I think we face something of the scope. If I was president, thank God I'm not, if I was president, I would start a Manhattan Project on global empathy. It has the urgency of the Manhattan Project. It needs the bringing together of the best minds in the world to focus on this issue because there's an urgency to it. And uh, I think Al Gore was right that time is running out. We can't wait 20 or 40 years to figure out what to do about this problem. So. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.